Good morning, Rimini. I hope you're all having a great conference so far. Um, my name is Angela, and I work for MAN AHL, which is a systematic hedge fund based in London, uh, where I'm a quant developer. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today to tell you about how you can make a full stack application with Python, NPM, Webpack, and React. Now, being able to transform an idea into an actual product is an incredibly valuable skill, both for your career and for you as a person. It can kind of take you from thinking of something and making a minimal viable product that you can either use to start a startup, make a new application at work, and get that promotion that you're looking for, because you can show that you can actually create things and make something happen. So today, um, I am going to be showing you how to make a simple web application like this. This is a single page web application. When you click the button, it changes with what it says by giving you hello in a different European language. It has a background, it has some style, but it's not really doing anything very complicated. So what does a web app look like? This is an example of this web application, which I would say is, in general, quite a good representation of what a web application would look like. It has a front end and it has a back end. The front end is what you see here in blue and green, and it consists of what the user sees and how the user interacts with the web application. Um, I'm going to explain this with the assumption that you have a basic understanding of what HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and Python is. Um, and if you are a perfect expert in all of these things, then this talk might be a little bit basic for you, uh, but bear with me. So the index.html page is what essentially creates uh, a structure for your website. Historically, this would be an entire skeleton of what your website looks like, but because we are using React, React actually componentizes all the pieces of your website, so all of these things actually live in React now instead of in HTML, and we will essentially just be loading in um, our compressed JavaScript React files into our uh, HTML file, and that's literally what that file is going to be. We then have these two light blue files at the top. It is our style file and our uh, JavaScript file. These have both been bundled uh, by our ex extra tools. So if you look in these dark blue files, uh, they are our React files. We take our React files, which have been written in uh, DSX. They are passed into the Babel um, converter. Babel converts them to normal JavaScript. Webpack then converts this to something that um, our browser can understand. Um, because Webpack only understands normal JavaScript. And then we attach those things to our browser. When we're talking to the back end, when we are uh, clicking that little button, what happens is that we are using a JavaScript library called jQuery to do our HTTP request to ask the server, hey, can I get a new type of hello, please? And the server will return that to us, and we will display it on our website. Uh, so for this example, we are being, going to be using Flask, uh, which I'll get back to more later. So, first things first. This is going to be our initial project setup. You have a, a folder. In your folder, you will have a readme to tell other people about your project and what you're doing, and you'll have a project folder, respectively. This project folder has a server folder and a static folder. The static folder is a front end. It holds your JavaScript, your Webpack, your Babel, your NPM. Um, and we're going to start by going in there uh, and building our front end. So the first thing we are going to need is a JavaScript package manager. And package manager, I'm sure you're all familiar with from using things like pip or apt-get. Um, and it really just manages your packages. It makes life so much easier because you don't have to worry about going to this website to download the new version of that package, making sure you have all the right dependencies, what are even my dependencies. By using a package manager, 
you just say, oh, I want this file and this file and this file, and it downloads the version you want or the latest version, and you can easily see what's going on. Uh, so, we are going to be using NPM. NPM is automatically included with Node.js if you still install that, but it is really a separate application. And you can use it with other languages than just Node.js, but it is a JavaScript package manager. It is very easy to use. It has uh, a lot of packages. It has about half a million packages. It's well documented and it is actively being developed. So it is essentially a safe option that isn't just going to be deprecated in two months. Uh, at least I hope not. Um, so the first thing we're just going to do is initializing NPM for our project. Um, this has really good defaults and you basically just follow the defaults and this creates a package.json file. The package.json file ends up in our static directory, like you can see here in pink. So for reference, everything that's pink is the things that have changed. Um, the package.json is really useful for multiple reasons. It is, it's just a file, you can look at it, and it tells you who is responsible for the project, uh, what version is the project, how do I contact the developers, what keywords are re rele relevant to this project, um, and it also means that any other developers can very easily install and run your project and it should be completely reproducible. So this is what my package.json looks like. As you can see, there's a name, there is a version, uh, there's de dependencies and a license. So everything I really need to know about how this front end works. Uh, the next thing we're going to need is a module bundler. This minimizes the number of script tags in your JavaScript. So if you've done a bit of JavaScript before, you know that once you start kind of having quite a few JavaScript files, you need to add them all to your HTML.index or similar. Um, and you need to add them in the right order because if you add them in the wrong order, then everything is a global and depending on you know, how you do this, it gets quite messy and it takes a long time to load. So by using Webpack, this bundles our dependencies. You essentially give it an entry point, and based on this entry point, it creates a dependency tree of all your dependencies. Um, and then you attach this bundled JavaScript file to your HTML. That is one script tag uh, for one entry point. Um, and this basically means that you no longer have to worry about globals, you no longer have to worry about which order do I import things in, you no longer have to worry about having loads of script tags and having really unreadable code. It's easy to see what's attached and how do I run it. It also does lazy module loading, which means that um, it's actually, essentially your pages are going to be loading faster. Um, right, so this is what Webpack looks like, uh, which it's um, more basically it's bundling. So it create, takes all your normal mod modules and turns them into static modules. Uh, one important thing to note about, note about Webpack is that it only understands JavaScript. This means that anything else needs to be converted into JavaScript to be used. This is both a benefit and a bit of a problem. This means that we need to add a loader or a plugin for everything else you want to add. This means you want to add CSS, there is a loader for that. You want to add files, there is a loader for that. You want to have a background image, there is a loader for that. So obviously there is a little bit of a um, learning curve here, but once you kind of start getting the hang of it, it's actually quite okay. Um, but the benefit of everything being a module is that you can attach it and require it inside your JavaScript. So I can require my CSS file in my JavaScript, and I can require my background image in my JavaScript, uh, which is actually what quite, really quite powerful. Um, and it also integrates seamlessly with NPM. So this is how we get started with Webpack. You install it using NPM, uh, and then you add a file called webpack.js. It really just has, uh, to, in the, at least, to, to, everything you need to get started is an entry point and the output. And the entry point is just gonna be our JavaScript directory and uh, the index file in there. And then our output is just going to be a bundle.js. Uh, and then we export this, and it ends up here in our static folder, um, and we can get, really get ready to use that. Now, if you want to have a, if you have an application that is a multi-page application, 
uh, instead of the single page application we are using, this is how you would do it. So you can have multiple different entry points for your different uh, sites. So you can have an index page, an about site, and they would all have a different entry point, creating a different bundle. So in this case, you can look at what happens in the output, where we have the bracket name.js, and this would just be named after your entry point name. Okay, so let's actually do something interesting with this. We're going to start by displaying an alert. Um, this is going to be our updated directory tree. We're just adding an index.html file and a JavaScript file. Um, and then you can also see where our bundle ends up. But, so, okay, the index. This is super easy. As I mentioned previously, you literally just add your bundle to your, the body of your file, and that's it. Everything you need to do. All the layout and behavior is in React. Uh, in our index.jsx file, all we're going to do is add an alert. This is literally the only fi file, uh, only sentence, effectively, that is in our file. Um, and that's enough to create an alert. We then need to build our application as well. Um, I always add some run commands when I build my application. Uh, a run command is just an alias. Um, for example, if you add a watch command, um, as you can see, I can just then use watch as the word instead of that remembering that entire line and all the parameters. Uh, and it just makes your development process a lot more fluid. Uh, it means that you don't have to remember the giant lines and you can kind of just do a build and it just builds. It's similar to using a make file. Um, so when you start the watch command, watch is special in the sense that you start in a different tab and you just keep it running and it automatically builds any change files and recreates a new bundle for you. So you don't need to worry about actually um, making sure that you've compiled your code manually because Watch is going to do that for you. That means you can refresh your browser window and see your changes immediately instead of sitting there going, okay, I made some changes, but they're not displaying and five minutes later you realize it's because you forgot to build. Uh, we open the index.html page and ta-da, we have an alert. Great. Okay, let's do something more interesting. Um, we're going to add React to this. Now, why am I using React? I really re like React because it allows you to build small componentized UIs with reusable components. Um, it makes it really easy to basically do repetitive things without having to write the same code over and over and over again, which is very good computer science um, um, methodology in general. Uh, it's easy to maintain, and it's easy to re-render components and change. And all the logic for a component lives within that component, which makes it very easy to um, basically see what's going on, see what lives where, and switch out one component for another one without problem. So we're going to install React, and then we are going to add a React file which is basically replacing that alert we had previously with this text. So for React, you always need to import React uh, to be able to use React, uh, obviously. Um, there's a few things to note here. The React DOM means that we're essentially displaying things in, um, with React. Um, as you can see, when I'm importing my app, there's a dot slash in front of it. This means I'm importing it from a local file that I've created instead of an external dependency. And you might think that being able to use brackets is kind of weird inside my JavaScript code, but this is essentially what JSX does. It allows you to use custom, effectively, HTML tags with your own created classes. So the app here is effectively our entry point into this part of our React code, our, our application. We are then going to add the app class, which is something that actually does something. Uh, in this case, we are going to just have it display Hello React. Um, and we need to export default on this class. So you always, need to be able to you always need to export your classes to be able to import them somewhere else. And it's good practice to only have one class per file, and which, which means that we can basically just export default. This is where our new file ends up in the JavaScript directory next to the index file. Now, what is JSX? It's effectively a 
uh, syntax ex extension to JavaScript. It means that you can use uh, XML and HTML tags in your JavaScript code, and you can use your custom classes directly in your JavaScript code. Um, so it lets you write those HTML tags you see there instead of react.createElement, blah, 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 which makes your code a lot more readable. Um, but how do we make our browser understand J JSX? Okay, so for this, we need to use Babel. Babel is fantastic. It converts your, you know, top state-of-the-art, really modern JavaScript into JavaScript that any browser can understand. So it allows you to use JavaScript <coughs> and allows you to use JavaScript uh, that is modern without having to wait three years for your browser to start eventually being compatible with it. Uh, it also allows you to use JSX because it converts JSX into standard old JavaScript. Um, so to be able to use Babel, we need to add presets. And Babel has presets, it basically means what types of JavaScript do you want me to understand and convert between? So we're gonna add ES2015 and we're going to add React, which basically means these are the currently the two types we can use. We then need to go to our Webpack config and also add a rule for how we're gonna treat JSX files. Note for this that we are excluding node modules. Node modules is uh, the directory where all your external dependencies end up. <coughs> this basically means that when we're not compiling this, we are gonna save a lot of time every time we're rebuilding our bundle because we're not interested in uh, retranslating this every time. Um, we are going to open the index.html page in our browser, and it should say hello React, which it does. Um, we then need to add a Python Flask server. Uh, you need to go to the server folder <coughs> and ensure you are in a per Python virtual environment. Um, you then need to basically install Flask because we are going to be using Flask. So I'm we use Flask for a project like this because it's a microsurvey or a micro framework. It's really easy to use and get started with. If I was doing a big industry project, I would probably be using something like Pyramid or Django instead, but it really depends on what you need to use it for. Um, and we're just adding a file called server.py to our server folder. In here, um, setting up Flask is very easy. <coughs> um, so uh, you just need to point at where your uh, static bundle is and where your index.html is. Thank you. Um, and then you need to, sorry. And then, okay. So we have two, two routes to our server. We have the default route that you get to when you just go to the server. And then you have the route you get to when you go to slash hello. Uh, we are going to be using the default route to just load our website. And then we're gonna be using the slash hello endpoint to get all those different hellos that you saw in the beginning. For now, it's just gonna return a static hello world. Uh, we can start our server and go to localhost 5000 and we will see that hello react we saw previously. Because then it's basically connected your React and your Python backend. Now, this is great, but how do we actually make React communicate with that backend? We need to use jQuery or whatever other library of your preference, but I quite like using jQuery. So uh, with jQuery, uh, we basically just uh, call the URL in question, which is our localhost URL with slash hello and then we get some data back. And with that data, we are going to display it in our console to check that it works, and we are also going to be passing it to a different function to handle that data. So this function you see here, we are going to be adding to our React code. Um, we are then going to be changing the Python in the back end to do something a little bit more interesting. So instead of just returning that static hello world, we are going to be returning a series of different European hellos. Um, notice that there is no English hello because then we would have to update our code in about a year to remove it anyway. Um, 
So yeah, and we just return a random word from that list. Um, and I think it's nice to be able to say hello to someone special instead of saying just a generic hello. So we are actually going to be making a few changes to our React code here. Um, we are going to be using a class instead of just putting all our code in, in our app file because that means that we could technically have 10 things saying hello to someone on our, web, on our front page instead of just one, but for the sake of this, we'll just do one. So you might recognize this as the render function from previously in our app.jsx file. Um, I made it a bit more interesting by adding a page header, which is where all our information is going to go. And also, we have this class now called hello, which is passing in a name called Rimini. What we want to do is we want to create a class called hello.jsx, and we want to pass in a parameter to it that is the name we want to say hello to. Okay, so how do we do that? To do that, you need to add a hello.jsx file, naturally. And then you need to create the hello class. As was previously, you need to export the fault on the class to make sure it's accessible outside. Um, and you need to have a constructor. The constructor passes in this thing called props. The props here is essentially everything you've passed in on creation of the class. Props are immutable and you're not allowed to change them. Um, we then therefore need to also have a state. States are internal. You can change them, and when changing state, that's generally when data is actually updated on your website. So when we click that button, and you see a different type of hello, that is because we've changed the state. And on updating of the state, your UI gets re-rendered. But we never touch the props. Um, so as you can see here, we are initializing the state with a greeting key, uh, and it just says hello and the name we pass in, which is Rimini. So, hello, Rimini. Um, also note that we have to rebind this. This is because this is not bound by default. So, when we are trying to call a function, when we click a button, if we don't rebind this on that function, uh, we're just gonna get undefined if we're trying to use this within the function. And this is just a JavaScript thing. It's not really a React thing as such. But it's important to keep in mind. Um, so we are going to be adding this function to our hello class, and this is the function that handles the data we passed in. Uh, so we get a new type of hello from our server, we pass it to this function as data, and then we re-render the state. Uh, when you re-render the state, you always have to use this .set state with your key, because if you try to do what we just did in the constructor, it's not actually going to re-render the UI. So that's why you always have to use this sort of set state. Um, so, okay, let's render that hello. Um, we want it to be output as a big hello, a little bit of a line, and then a button that you can click to change your hello. To do this, um, I am added an H1 with our actual greeting, an HR in the middle, and then a button that goes, say hello whenever you click hello. Uh, and I've used the uh, bootstrap buttons for this because they come by default with quite a nice UI without you having to do anything. And they have a React version that you can just import that already has loads of this functionality. So, what do we get now? We get a UI that says, hello, Rimini, and a button. Great, okay, so how do we go from this to something a little bit more interesting? Um, I want to add some CSS. Uh, and as previously, JavaScript only, or Webpack only understands JavaScript, uh, so I need to add a loader. Um, and I'm going to install the style loader, the CSS loader, and an extract plugin. Uh, we need these two loaders to convert our CSS files, and then we need the extract plugin to be able to extract our uh, bundled CSS from our generic JavaScript bundle into something we can actually attach directly to our index.html file so we can render our JavaScript and our CSS separately. If you don't extract it and uh, attach it separately, 
um, you're basically going to have your UI probably be rendered after all your JavaScript has gotten, been rendered, which is going to have very weird side effects. Um, so we need to add a plugin, which is the extract plugin. And the name in pink you can see there is what we've decided to name our bundled CSS file. Um, and that is what it's going to look like in our directory tree. Note that there is a difference between uh, my CSS file, fullstack.css, and my bundled file, style.css. And this is because our browser only has access to the bundled files. If you try to load up the normal CSS file, you're not really going to get the result you expect. It's just not going to apply your styles. So you need to attach the bundled one and uh, basically load that up. Um, so how we do that is adding a full stack.css to our folder. Um, I've added a few styles to it, just something to make it look a bit nicer. Um, and then I need to require my full stack.css file in my React code. If you don't load it into your React code, it's not going to be picked up when Webpack is bundling, and it's going to think you have no styles applied. And as a result, it's not actually going to get compiled. Um, and then we need to add the style sheet, which is the bundle style sheet, to our index.html page. And what we end up with then is this. Um, and now you can see our style has been applied, uh, it looks different, and it's quite nice. But I would still like to basically add a background image. Adding a background image um, is just adding an image to our image folder. Um, we need to then use a file loader to load that image. Uh, when you use a file loader, you can specify what types of files you want it to load. So in our case, we are going to specify that we will load JPEGs and PNGs, etc. And that is just another rule in your Webpack config. Um, and then you need to uh, basically add a background URL to your CSS, as we've done here. But the caveat here is just adding this to your CSS is not going to actually make your image show up. You need to also load your image in your React code to be able to have that image show up. And this is something that a lot of people seem to be quite confused about, um, just judging by Googling it. Um, because, because basically you need to import your image, you then need to create a new image object and add your image as the source for that new image object, and then you need to render your image uh, in your render function in that file. And only if you do all of those steps are your images actually going to show up, otherwise you, you're not going to see anything. You're going to see that white page we saw previously. So what we have now is an app that has a background image. It has some nice CSS. We have managed to position it where we want it to on the page. And when you click the button, it says hello in different European languages. So thank you for listening. And any questions? Uh, you can find me on engineering on Twitter. Uh, this is also the same handle uh, I use on GitHub and Medium, and there is a blog post about how you can do this step by step, and all the code is also on GitHub. So you can either follow the blog post and do this step by step, or you can go to GitHub and just get all the code immediately. Uh, the slides are also being uploaded on the EuroPython website, of course. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Hi, and thank you for your talk. Uh, uh, is there a reason you don't use uh, Yarn in place of NPM? No particular reason. It's, um, I, I really like using NPM. I've been using it for a while. It is really good support. It works really well. Uh, I've never had an issue with using it, no compatibility issues, um, and it basically does what I need. So I see no reason to switch at present.
Any other questions? Have you got any suggestion about a trade-off uh, between the uh, server-side code uh, and uh, the client-side code? Because uh, sometimes, uh, of course, uh, the um, uh, rendering the page uh, client-side gives you benefits in terms of speed, but of course, uh, uh, many times your device is not uh, uh, is not powerful enough to <laughs> to render your your page. So maybe you have some. Uh, uh, trade-offs uh, that uh, or some uh, suggestion that uh, you want to share and uh, or maybe uh, I don't know you have some tips and tricks uh, about that yes so technically you can react render react server side as well but I would say in general uh, it's quite good practice to just try to minimize the sizes of your web pages use lazy loading try to split up what you're doing on different pages uh, to not try to load, you know, a multi-megabyte image immediately with all your functions and try to do 10 different calls. So kind of try to optimize your page in that way. And also you obviously want to put all your application logic in your backend. So any long running applications, any complex computations, anything like that, I would always put in my backend and just leave the front end as rendering the nice things. Anything I can can I do asynchronously in the back end? It's perfect, basically. Um, so, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you for listening.